you got your Bibles with you, we are picking up the Gospel of Mark in Mark chapter 6. My wife, Teresa, gives me a hard time often for the things that she'll find me watching on television, mostly for just how weird and random they are. Uh, I, I don't know what it is, but you know, I'll just be flipping through the channels and something will grab my attention. And next thing you know, I've devoted like an hour to this thing. Like recently, uh, I found on TBS this slap competition, which is just that. It's two dudes standing across from each other, slapping each other in the face until one of them gets knocked out. Like, I, I know it's dumb, it's barbaric, but like I just couldn't turn away from watching people just slap each other. Um, I'll find these random documentaries that have nothing to do with the things I'm normally interested in, but I just, I get hooked and I get lost in them. Most recently, one about deer. Like, the whole documentary was just about deer. And, and that's random for me because, I mean, look at me, I'm obviously not a hunter. Um, I, I'm not a forester, but I just, I don't know, I got hooked in. It was talking about varieties of deer all over the world. And, and I'm glad I watched it because I learned that deer don't sweat. I never really thought about it before. I never assumed that they did, but they don't sweat. They're like dogs. They cool their body by panting, by opening their mouth. And, and that's important because to a predator of the deer, when the deer pants, it gives off a certain odor that makes it easier to track. And so when something like a wolf is, is preying on them, as the deer runs, it pants harder, which only gives off more of that odor, which only leads its predator to find it easier. There is one thing, though, I learned that deer can do to mask their odor, and that is to drink water, uh, right? The, the way that they can disguise that odor is by drinking. And so obviously water not just uh, rehydrates the deer, but uh, it proves to be its source of safety. And so consider then those words that Belinda just read for us, that as the deer pants for flowing streams, so I long for you, God. I've always thought that I knew what this verse meant, what that song that we just listened to meant, that just as a parched animal needs refreshment, so too I should look to God for my refreshment. And of course that's true, but now knowing what we do about deer, we see that there's much more to this analogy that the psalmist uses. That God is not only a source of refreshment, but God is also a place of safety. That as enemies gather around to mock the psalmist, that as seasons of despair and hopelessness come into his life, God indeed is that mighty fortress for his soul. See, this fall as we've been journeying through the gospel of Mark, we've been asking a simple question of who then is this Jesus? And each week, Mark has been showing us that Jesus is more than what we have perceived, more than what we can expect that he's not just a miracle worker, he's not just a wise teacher. We've seen how he's sovereign over nature, over chaos, over the forces of evil. That he alone can make us new, he alone can make us clean. And so what he does this morning is he shows us next how he alone is our source of life, how Jesus truly is our refuge. That as all the institutions of this world fail us, and as people around us fail us, that Jesus is the one that brings healing and comfort and cleanness to those who would surrender to him. Now it's a long passage, you can tell this morning, we're covering three chapters, and that's because we want to see the bigness, the big picture of what Mark is showing us. And the big thing that he does today is he's showing us a contrast between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. That what Jesus is doing is, is something new. But the kingdom of this world will not go down lightly. How the kings of this life won't relinquish their power willingly. Even more so how the self-idolatry of the human heart resists surrender to this coming king. It's not some magical switch that we flip and poof, all of a sudden it, it's all done. Mark is showing us how news of this kingdom, yes, brings success, but also brings conflict. And so we read, picking up in verse 7. Jesus summoned the twelve and began to send them out in pairs and gave them authority over unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the road except the staff, 
no bread, no traveling bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on an extra shirt. He said to them, whenever you enter into a house, stay there until you leave that place. If any place does not welcome you or listen to you, when you leave there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons, anointed many sick people with oil, and healed them. There's an urgency to this mission that Jesus gives to his disciples. He wants them to be mobile, be able to move quickly, which is why he tells them to pack so lightly. God's kingdom is on the move, and they were to be heralds of it. They were to be messengers explaining to the people, here's what is happening. And so Jesus gives them this authority to heal, to drive out demons, that through their signs and wonders, they would validate the message they're proclaiming. And we read that they have incredible success doing it, so much so that even King Herod heard about it, because Jesus' name had become well known. Man, something is happening to the, to the level that now even the royal court is hearing about it, and they're shaken about this news that there's this kingdom that is coming, right? The kingdoms of this world, they, they sit up, they take notice, which sparks, we read, this wild conspiracy theory that John the Baptist had somehow risen from the dead. Well, risen from the dead. When did John the Baptist die? Did we, did we miss that, you know, in our reading so far? Well, Mark takes a moment now to catch us up, right? Because the last we heard about John the Baptist was in chapter 1 when he was arrested. And how his arrest signaled to Jesus that now was the time to begin his ministry. And so Mark now is catching us up. Here's what happened with John the Baptist. You see, John had been very vocal in his criticism of King Herod. He saw King Herod as a false king. For one, you remember, he had been set up by the Romans. He represented this outside, evil, oppressive empire. But Herod had also, we found out, had married his brother's ex-wife, thereby committing adultery, thereby violating the law of God. And so in John the Baptist's mind, all this was proof that he is this false king, that he is wicked, and he did not hide, John did, his feelings about this. Well, of course, in the ancient world, you can't just wander around the the villages and around the countryside denouncing the king or, or calling his wife, you know, an adulteress. And so Herod had him arrested, thought, okay, I'll put him in prison, I'll shut him up, there's no more damage he can do from there. Well, that wasn't good enough for Herod's new wife. She didn't take kindly to be called an adulteress. And so one night after uh, an evening of heavy drinking and partying, Herodias, Herod's new wife, asked his da- her daughter to perform this elaborate dance for Herod. Herod is so impressed by it that he says to the young girl, I'll give you whatever you want. Well, Herodias had instructed her daughter to ask for the head of this troublesome prophet. Herod, he has made this vow in front of everybody. He has to follow through with it. And so sure enough, he has John executed. All interesting stuff, but why does Mark include it here? Well, first, this wild conspiracy theory that John had somehow risen from the dead indicates just how successful these 12 disciples were in preaching news of the kingdom. Second, though, Mark is starting to paint two pictures of two very different kinds of kingdoms, of two very different kinds of kings. Here we have in Herod, this one who sits on his throne, and he uses his position, his power, for his own pleasure, for his own exploitation. Meanwhile, Jesus is the kind of king who uses his power, who uses his privilege to heal, to bring peace, to bring relief to Israel. Jesus doesn't use his power for himself. No, he is the true shepherd that the people need. And so whereas the kingdoms of this world take, and whereas they oppress, the kingdom of God gives and liberates. Third, though, Mark includes this here to begin to introduce to us a theme of persecution and of suffering. Right, John the Baptist, he obeyed his calling. He did what God called him to do. He spoke truth to power, and for that what? He was arrested and beheaded. Mark is showing us the cost of discipleship. 
the cost of following Jesus. Just as Jesus was not the kind of Messiah that many people were expecting, we see that the inauguration of his kingdom doesn't look like what we would expect either. Yes, there's healings. Yes, there's miracles. There's also pain that comes to the people of God. There's suffering that comes their way for following Jesus. And though that may not actually feel like good news, maybe that's not the rah-rah message that you were hoping to come and hear this morning, this should be of great comfort to us as Christians. Think about it, as we mentioned before, Mark, he's in Rome. Think about the intense persecution that he and his fellow church members that they were experiencing. How throughout all the Roman Empire, all around the Mediterranean, Christians were suffering for their faith. And how under those kind of circumstances, how easy it would have been to lose hope. Think about John the Baptist himself. He had doubted, Jesus, are you really the Messiah? How easy it would have been to wonder, God, are you really in control? Because it doesn't look like it. Is your kingdom coming? Because it doesn't feel like it. That's often what hardship and suffering does in our lives. Right? I, to the best of my knowledge, maybe no one here is being persecuted overtly for their faith, but certainly living as a citizen of the kingdom of God should bring challenges in our daily lives. Maybe in work you've tried to work with integrity, not cut corners, and maybe you've not prospered as much as those around you have. Or you've determined, I'm not going to give my career every waking hour, I'm going to protect my family, I'm going to protect my church life. And because you've not been a slave to work, others have been promoted when you have not. Maybe you've turned down opportunities because ethically it just wasn't quite right. You've done the right thing in your life, and yet you look around you and everyone else seems to be having worldly success. And you're wondering, has this really been worth it? God, am I not doing what you want me to be doing? Why am I not prospering like I see others do? Think about how just suffering or sickness can lead us to doubt a child with cancer the loss of a loved one personal ailments personal hurt god if your kingdom really has begun if i'm a citizen of that kingdom then why have you allowed this to happen are you there is this really worth it mark shows us that hardship persecution suffering these are a part of the Christian life, and we should not be surprised, we should not be caught off guard when it comes. Mark also shows us, though, that we are not alone in our suffering and in our hardships, that we have a Savior who deeply knows our hurts, a Savior who is with us in the fire, and that the final victory is His. For yes, you will have suffering in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. All this sets the stage then for two major miracles, which again are not randomly recorded by Mark. There's some deep theological themes in these miracles that help us see just who Jesus is and what he is doing. We read verses 31 and following that exhausted by their journeys... Jesus and his disciples, they retreat in a boat to cross over the Sea of Galilee. Well, people get wind that this is where they're going, and so what do the people do? They go around the banks of the sea, and they're waiting for Jesus and his disciples when they get there. Like, geez, thanks guys. You know, like, I, I needed a break, and yet you're here. People can be really needy. And yet, look at this. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd then he began to teach them many things again look at this contrast between herod and jesus look at the heart of a true king jesus looks at these people and he sees how they are eager for something even though they don't actually know what they're eager for right they didn't know what kind of shepherd they needed they didn't know what kind of king. In fact, it would even seem before Jesus, they hadn't quite realized just how much their king had failed them. How much their religious leaders had failed them. They didn't know what they were missing. They didn't know what they needed. And yet, as they encounter this Jesus, they can sense there is something 
about him. Jesus looks at them just as he looks at each of us and he has compassion. Right, what did we see Herod doing? Feasting, over drinking, beheading the prophet of Israel. And yet here are the people of Israel and they are hungry. They're hungry for Jesus' words, but Mark tells us they're also literally hungry. Their king gluttonously just feeds himself. They go without. They're looking for a leader. And again, it's not just Herod that has failed them. It's the religious leaders who have failed to feed them as well. And so Jesus looks at the people. They look at him. Is he maybe it? Well, the disciples observe it's getting late. Hey, Jesus, you really need to wrap things up, man. I mean, it's about to be mealtime. Jesus says to them, you give them something to eat. Man, these poor disciples. What in the world is Jesus talking about here? Think about the disciples themselves. They're tired. They're, they're hungry. They're probably a little hangry themselves. And so I think that's why they almost respond with sarcasm. Like, yeah, okay, sure. Should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Yeah, Jesus, with all that extra money that we've just been carrying around, yeah, we'll just go use that. And all those vendors who are selling bread will just go buy that. Yeah, sure. Like, what do you want us to do, Jesus? What are you asking of us? Now, of course, with the benefit of hindsight and with the illuminating presence of the Holy Spirit, we know that Jesus means something else when he says you give them something to eat. He's talking about the crowd's lack of spiritual nourishment. Again, Jesus knows a time is coming when he will leave and it will be the apostles who will shepherd the people, the apostles who will teach the people, the apostles who will feed them spiritually. And so you might say then that this miracle Jesus performs next is as much, if not more, a lesson for the disciples than it is for the people. Right? Jesus organizes the people. He gives the disciples instructions. We read verse 39. He instructed them to have all the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. Again, not random details. We have seen Mark does not waste his words in this gospel. You see, to, to Mark's audience, the people who would have been first reading this, this picture of the people on the hillside, it would have conveyed the idea of a banquet uh, to the Gentiles. It might have even conveyed an idea of a, of a religious feast to the Jewish readers. You see, specifically, the, the word Mark uses is symposia, which, yes, is translated as groups, but literally it means a drinking party or a banquet. A banquet. Look at how this scene is in direct contrast to what we just saw Herod doing. Again, two drastically different kingdoms. Two drastically different kings. Even this detail about the green grass tells us that this is all happening in spring at the time of the Passover. And what do we see but a shepherd leading his flock to a bountiful pasture? For the Lord is my shepherd. I have what I need. He lets me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. It's a picture of new creation coming where God's love and care for his people overflows for them. And this is what this next miracle of walking on water is meant to show. How Jesus is not just powerful over nature, but that this Jesus who is all-powerful is with his people, cares about his people. Right? We read that Jesus has his disciples get back in the boat, return to the other side of the sea. Meanwhile, he goes up on top of the mountain to pray overlooking the Sea of Galilee. We see a storm suddenly surprise the disciples, just like what we saw in chapter 4, where Jesus calmed the wind and the seas. But Jesus intends to do something different this time. He doesn't seem to intend to help the disciples. Rather, we read verse 48, very early in the morning, Jesus came toward them, walking on the sea, and wanted to pass by them wanted to pass by them. Like, it's really easy for us to read that verse and, and the walking on water part to grab our attention as it should. But what does it mean that he wanted to pass by them? 
Like, he's just, you know, hey guys, hope you, hope you do okay, I'll see you later, and just leave. Like, what, what is going on? Well, if I can bore you with some more Greek this morning, this verb, parakomai, it's the same verb used in the Greek Old Testament in Exodus 33 and Exodus 34 when God passes by Moses, right? And, and that sentence, Moses says, show me your glory, and God hides him in the rock, and he passes by so that Moses may experience a glimpse of the glory of Yahweh. This is also the same verb used in 1 Kings 19 when Elijah is before God at Mount Oreb. And God, again, does the same thing. In both of these instances in the Old Testament, the purpose is to reveal something of his glory to these prophets that they had not yet experienced or known before. And so what Mark is doing by using this verb is he is saying to us, this Jesus who walks on water, this Jesus who passes by his disciples, is the very same God of Moses and Elijah. This is God himself with them. Thus he says, have courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Literally, he doesn't even say it is I. Ego em me, I am the very name of God. And all of this just flies over the head of the disciples. They were completely astounded because they had not understood about the loaves. Instead, their hearts were hardened. Jesus is calling them to a deeper faith that if they could just see who he really is, if they could just see what he really is doing, that not only would they have courage, not only would they have resilience in the hardships of life, but they would, be, they would be able to join with Jesus in the proclamation of this new kingdom. You see, in our passage, we see this contrast between Herod and Jesus, how Jesus is this true and better king. And as our true and better king, he has compassion on us. He desires to be with us, to shepherd us, to lead us, to protect us. How he is bringing the glories of heaven to us. And he wants us not just to be a part of this kingdom, but to join with him in building it. All this sets the stage as we turn to chapter 7, a scene that I think was written in 2020 during the lockdown, because it's all about hand washing. The Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him. They observed that some of his disciples were eating bread with unclean, that is, unwashed hands. Whoa, big deal, you know? Sounds like my wife talking to my kids, you know? Mark clears all this up, though. There's a lot of background we could go into. You probably have already had your fill of that this morning. But just suffice it to say, this is a lot like what we saw earlier in Mark's gospel with the Sabbath laws, right? There had been codes, there had been traditions created throughout the centuries to help God's people better follow the law, right? This would be like pastoral counsel on, on sin, right? God's law says, don't do this. And so let me just kind of give you some, some helpful tips or some advice on, on how to fight sin. What I'm saying is not the law, but it's intended to help you follow the law. This is exactly what these codes had been like. That these teachers of the law had said to Israel, here's how to follow the law. But unfortunately, by Jesus' day, these codes had become so elaborate, so complicated, that nobody could legitimately follow them except for the Pharisees. In other words, the Pharisees had created this system that made them look super holy and made everyone else look unholy. These codes were no longer about honoring God. These codes were no longer about how to, how to keep the law. These codes were a way of just showing, I'm better than you. And so you should listen to me on everything. And so when these religious elites attack Jesus on the issue of observing these codes, we see that the issue is not because they're concerned about God's worship, but because they recognize Jesus is a threat to their way of life. Right? What if people start to believe Jesus, that these codes aren't that important? Well, then we'll lose our power, we'll lose our wealth, we'll lose our influence. And so they attack Jesus, which is obviously then why he calls them 
hypocrites. He says, you're concerned with God's law only where it fits your agenda. And when God's law doesn't fit your agenda, somehow you creatively find ways to skirt around it. Mark tells us here in this passage that they had created financial loopholes as a way of not having to observe some of God's law. In other words, where they could use the law to make money, they did. And where the law then threatened their money, they found ways around it. Mark is showing us again that as much as Herod had failed Israel, so had the religious leaders failed the people. And so what Jesus is saying in this parable about eating and what makes a person clean or unclean, he's saying, no, an entirely new work needs to be done. And it cannot be accomplished through politics. It cannot be accomplished through religion. I have come to deal with people's hearts. That acceptance by God isn't based on what you do or what you don't do. It's not defined by ethnicity or works of the law or birthright or privilege. It's by faith and surrender that the Holy Spirit comes and makes that which is unclean, clean, but from the inside out. And so Mark is inviting us just to recognize the need that we have in our lives. And that there is no system of religion, that there is no governmental system, there is no institution of this world that can possibly fix us. How all these self proclaimed rulers and kings and influencers of this world have failed us that he alone can set things to rights. And so all this becomes plainer as we turn to chapter 8. Jesus now feeds a crowd again, this time 4,000 men in addition to women and children. And it's easy just to kind of fly past it as if, as if Mark is just rehashing another similar story. But again, he's challenging us, Mark is. Do you recognize who Jesus is and what he is doing? Right, he invites the disciples to help him again. Because again, he's performing these miracles more than anything for their sake. Let me show you who I am. Let me show you what I am doing so that you will be able to do the same. And yet again, the disciples just don't get it. They recognize that this man seems to be king. He seems to be the Messiah. But we weren't expecting Messiah who just multiplied loaves and fishes. No, we're expecting this Messiah to come in on a stallion to free us from our bondage. And again, ironically, that's exactly what Jesus has come to do. But to free first from the bondage to sin that lives within every human heart. And so consider the irony of what comes. Jesus has fed the 5,000. He's fed the 4,000. They all get in a boat, and one of the disciples begin to wonder or or worry about. We forgot to pack food. Jesus is almost dumbfounded with them. Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Don't you understand or comprehend? Do you have hardened hearts? Do you have eyes and not see? Do you have ears and not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of leftovers did you collect? Twelve, they told him. When I broke the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many baskets full of pieces did you collect? Seven. And he said to them, don't you understand yet? How can you not see who I am? How can you not see what I am doing? All this sets the tone for next week when Peter confesses Jesus as the Messiah. And he'll say it. And yet we'll see that he still doesn't understand what that means. That the disciples still don't understand what it means. Jesus offers anyone who would follow him the bread of life. He offers salvation, life, abundant and free. But we must have eyes of faith. We need to check our expectations at the door. We need to check our demands at the door and simply receive Jesus for who he is and what he says I want to do in your life. As the song we began with this morning tells us our souls long for something. We all long for something. We hunger, safety, for peace, 
for comfort, for joy, for hope. Our souls long for God. And Jesus looks upon you and he looks upon me this morning with compassion and wants to do this life-changing work in us. Will we be hard of heart and closed off to what he wants to do? Or will we have the courage to surrender and rest safely with him? It's by providence that we're celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning. I didn't look at the calendar and see if we were going to do the Lord's Supper and said, oh, let me, let me do a message on feeding miracles. Likewise, I didn't do the message and say, well, let's, let's do in communion this morning. I just think it's by providence that we're sitting here looking at how Jesus desires to feed us and what an illustration we have of that that he invites us to feed on him. And obviously, it's just bread, it's just juice. There's nothing special or magical about these elements themselves. It's an invitation to come and to find our sustenance, our refuge, everything that we need in Jesus alone. To remember that that's why his body was broken and his blood shed, to make that possible, that in him we would find all that we need. And so if you've surrendered your life and faith to Jesus, this meal is for you this morning, and I invite you to take it. If you've not yet surrendered to Jesus in faith, we're glad you're here. This is exactly where we want you to be. But the Bible says that uh, this ordinance is for believers. And so just let the plates uh, pass by, uh, and please continue to, to watch and to worship with us. But let's prepare our hearts in prayer. Father, I ask that you would truly feed us this morning, that you would nourish our souls with your very presence. Father, we recognize that we, we hunger and we thirst not because you aren't enough, but because we try to fill ourselves up on all sorts of other things. We continue to return to these dry, empty wells, thinking that they will somehow provide us refreshment when you alone have the words of life, that Jesus is that bread of life on which we may feast and never hunger again. And so, Father, by your Spirit, just ask that you would assure us of your good favor toward us in Christ Jesus, that you would strengthen our faith, that you would give us the courage to surrender anew to you that there are so many things in this life that we are holding to on with white knuckles because we are so afraid to let go. We are so afraid to not be in control. Give us the faith to surrender. For you are our mighty fortress. You are our refuge. You are all we need. Lead us in this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.